Hello, Jeff Weiss back to talk about genetics and plant breeding, uh, the art and science of genetic manipulation. Uh, this is Unit 5. And the um, photograph here is of a shimmera. It's a, uh, a genetic mutation on the petal of a tulip. Um, mutations are a form of genetic uh, alteration and have been um, used extensively in uh, tulip uh, production over the years to generate and preserve uh, some of the amazing number of varieties of tulips. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, about other types of genetic uh, characteristics and how um, they're used in producing uh, horticultural plants. The learning objectives are to discuss how genetics are used to improve horticultural plants, uh, but first to explain the factors responsible for the genetic variation that we see, and to produce a what's called a Punnett square to il illustrate how different uh, uh, genes come together to um, produce different um, genetic traits and uh, the traits that we see uh, when we look at plants. Um, so the one of the videos for today will have uh, a, a discussion on uh, Punnett squares and we'll set up the problem uh, for this week's assignment. We'll look at uh, the steps in a plant breeding program and we're also going to cover uh, biotech and uh, genetically modified organisms. Uh, by the end of uh, this assignment, uh, you'll have a perspective on whether uh, genetically modified organisms, GMOs, are good or bad, and you're going to uh, provide your uh, opinion based on your uh, uh, on the information from this assignment in our unit five discussion. Here's the some of the key terms and concepts we're going to be talking about tonight. There's quite a bit. This is uh, some pretty dense material. Um, hang in there. And um, I, for for those of you who've recently had high school biology, um, this may be largely review. For those of you who haven't, um, there's going to be quite a bit of new material here. And uh, I hope you'll take time to um, learn it and develop uh, develop your expertise. So when we talk about genetics, uh, we're talking about the um, science that studies the heredity and the variation in organisms uh, that get transferred through their genes. And there's a number of um, basic concepts or rules that apply uh, in this area. And I'll go through them uh, real quickly uh, in summary form, and then we're going to get into uh, more depth in several of these as we go into subsequent slides. But first, each cell, whether it's a plant or an animal, has one nucleus. The name of the grouping that holds both the plant and the animal kingdom is eukaryo eukaryotes, and uh, the name comes from one nucleus. Uh, each nucleus has many chromosomes in the human genome. Uh, there's uh, 46 chromosomes in 23 pairs. And each of those chromosomes has many, many, many genes. So literally um, millions of genes uh, combine to make up our um, uh, heredity. Our, uh, and, and that number varies uh, widely between uh, various plants and animals. Some um, uh, organisms have as few as uh, four sets of chromosomes, four pairs of chromosomes, uh, while others have uh, even more than uh, human beings. Um, each of the genes uh, in those chromosomes has alleles or alternative forms of the gene, and we're going to be talking about alleles and how they uh, combine and segregate when plants uh, reproduce. When they reproduce, one allele goes with each gamete sex cell, and the gametes are the ovum or the egg, the female uh, gamete, 
and the pollen grain, the male uh, gamete. And each of these um, has one allele uh, for each gene. And when they combine, the genetic material of the parent of the offspring gets mixed up from what the parents provided. Now these genes may be dominant, recessive, or complex, and we'll talk about what that means. And they may be homozygous, uh, the same, or heterozygous, different at each uh, or for each gene. In other words, uh, if a uh, a gene is homozygous, it has uh, the same allele in each of the um, pairs. If it's heterozygous, they have different uh, alleles and can be, um, um, can show uh, different genetic traits based on uh, whether the genes are dominant, recessive, or complex. More about all of this uh, in upcoming slides. So here's the genotype versus phenotype. Um, an example here is where um, the um, large A uh, red color gene is, uh, is dominant. Anytime that large uh, A is present, um, you have a red rose. When it's absent, in the case of a uh, little a, little a, uh, you have a white rose. So the genotype, uh, there's uh, basically three genotypes for this characteristic. Large A, large A, large A, small A, little A, little A. And the um, plant looks red um, in a dominant uh, gene, whether it has one or two big A's. The phenotype uh, is red or white. However, um, in in a different type of situation where the um, uh, large A and small A are codominant, in that case uh, the phenotype, the, that is the, um, the characteristic that we see, uh, can be red, pink, or white um, depending on the genotype. So the genotype is the actual combination of uh, uh, genes, in this case uh, large A and small a, and the phenotype is the actual appearance of the plant that um, comes out of the genotype. So um, this is a little out of sequence, but um, this talks about how um, two types of cell division. Uh, the first one is normal cell division where um, there's two chromosomes uh, uh, at the beginning and two chromosomes at the end. Uh, this is the normal uh, division that allows plants uh, to grow and develop. Whereas on the do on the um, on the lower um, area, um, this is a different uh, type of cell division called meiosis. It's where the chromosomes split pr to produce the sex or gamete cells. Uh, and then these cells are capable of combining with the chromosomes of another plant. So what's uh, the beginning of this process are four chromosomes and at the end are two and, and this uh, daughter uh, cell can combine with a, uh, a, a, a pollen grain which also has two chromosomes and produce a new plant with four new chromosomes. So getting back to genotype phenotype, uh, the genes uh, are one factor uh, and, and they interact with the environment to produce the phenotype. So the genotype plus the environment yields the phenotype or the characteristics of the plant that you see. And the ability of one genotype to produce more than one phenotype occurs when plants are exposed to different environments. So um, this is called plasticity. And we're going to talk uh, later on uh, about an example uh, with a blue rose where the rose color uh, can be uh, produced um, because of environmental um, 
factors, uh, including uh, the uh, pH or other chemicals in the soil. So how do genes transfer information? Well, this is uh, fairly technical, but um, uh, DNA is the, uh, is the answer. Uh, DNA is a uh, chemical molecule composed of four different little types called nucleotides. Uh, a, T, G, and C are the initials for them, and it's the sequence of just these four um, chemicals that determine everything about the, um, the heredity or the uh, genotypes that we and plants carry around inside our, our chromosomes. And the uh, important thing about DNA is it occurs in a double strand and when that strand gets um, pulled apart there are um, little sites on those uh, strands that can attract other um, uh, nucleotides and then that can enable either the DNA to reproduce itself or to produce uh, an, uh, another substance called RNA or messenger RNA and that messenger RNA uh, takes the template the information off of that strand and can transfer it to form proteins and it's proteins that do the work of cells um, they um, produce the uh, all of the chemical materials or the uh, hormones uh, that uh, result in the plant uh, in the plant cell um, growing and reproducing and conducting its uh, its business including uh, uh, taking in and, and releasing water and chemicals and everything else that the cell is responsible to do all of that occurs through this process of DNA uh, transcription to RNA and then building uh, proteins on those uh, on those RNA uh, sites and the sequence as I mentioned the sequence sequence of these uh, nucleotides ATGC uh, are translated by cells um, and um, the combination of these things is called the genetic code. So the genetic code in the DNA is uh, this long, long um, string of letters and um, those uh, letters differ between um, individuals. So um, chromosomes for um, your, your parents uh, had different combinations of DNA and when those strands were torn apart and recombined to create you, you had now your own unique combination of DNA. Same is true for plants and here is the rest of the story about how the DNA transfers, the strands of DNA transfer to RNA and in turn are used to build proteins that um, get the actual work done in cells. So who figured, it, who figured this out? Well, it all started with uh, Gregor Mendel, Mendel uh, who lived in the 1800s and he was a, uh, a monk uh, who lived in a monastery. Um, but he had a garden that he worked in and he had the, both the intelligence and the good luck to work with, uh, with peas and peas, uh, many of the characteristics in peas have uh, patterns of inheritance that are um, governed by just a few traits and Mendel took meticulous notes and uh, did many um, uh, crosses of uh, peas and recorded his observations and uh, his work on inheritance was, was uh, lost for years after he died but when it was rediscovered he was given credit for um, being the first person to figure out uh, 
many of the concepts that we're going to cover in the next few in the next few slides. So the principles of Mendelian inheritance, and you're going to be getting at this a little bit with your uh, Punnett squares, um, so don't go to sleep here. Um, he realized that um, yellow and green pea color was uh, uh, followed certain rules, so followed certain ma mathematical rules, and that when he crossed a yellow and a green um, pea, uh, the first generation always had yellow seeds, which means yellow was the dominant trait. However, in the next generation, when he crossed the uh, the yellow um, uh, the plants from with the yellow seeds, he found out that consistently there was a three to one ratio of yellow to green in the next generation. So he was uh, intelligent enough to realize that this was um, a very important uh, idea and uh, key to understanding the basic mechanisms of how genes are passed down and inherited. So his three important conclusions from experimental results was first that there was some factor that was passed on to from parents to offspring unchanged. Uh, we now call those units genes. Prior to that um, a lot of people believe that um, traits were um, developed during the life of animals and plants. I, I guess the classic example was um, belief that um, giraffes developed their long necks by stretching and reaching for uh, leaves high up in trees. Uh, as they grew, their necks stretched because that's how they uh, ate their food. And uh, of course, uh, that was a ridiculous notion, but um, it was the best, uh, prior to Mendel, it was the best explanation um, available for how um, different plants and animals uh, developed uh, their, um, their traits over time. So um, there's these units uh, called genes that determine uh, the traits that we have. And an individual inherits one trait from each parent. And a trait may show up, but it can, uh, or a trait may not show up, but it can still be passed on to the next generation. Uh, that's this idea of a recessive gene. So one of his ex experiments uh, the two parent plants were homozygous for seed, for seed color, yellow and green. And uh, in the first generation, um, each of the parents passed on one of the um, alleles, a Y allele and a G allele to the offspring. Uh, so they were all yellow because uh, yellow is the dominant uh, genotype. In the next generation, things got interesting though because um, there were 75% um, yellow, yellow seeds. All of those with two YYs um, had yellow, and one 25% had uh, green seeds. And the green seeds were produced only where the uh, plant had both alleles G and in those instances, it was a, um, a recessive trait, but a, a green phenotype occurred uh, when only the green uh, genes were present. So uh, another idea was this principle of segregation, so that for any particular trait, the pair of alleles from each parent separate and only one goes to each offspring. Uh, this is the secret of um, diversity, of maintaining uh, a, a diverse uh, gene pool and is uh, critical to plants uh, adapting uh, because they have uh, different traits that might allow uh, some members of the population to survive 
even if environmental conditions change or, um, for instance, uh, uh, predators uh, develop a, uh, an ability to uh, eat plants, um, some uh, members of that plant may survive because they have different, uh, different characteristics that discourage that predator. So that's basically um, how uh, plants and animals um, uh, evolve over time is by creating new combinations of genes, some of which are, um, uh, are not adaptive, uh, but some of them will help the, um, help the uh, species survive and evolve over time. Then independent assortment. Um, the different pairs are passed independently to each other, or independently of each other, and the result is new combinations of, uh, of genes uh, that were in neither parent. So this is, again, the, uh, one of the keys to um, evolutionary success over time. So how are these ideas adapted and used in breeding new plants? Well, um, plant breeding is both an art and a science, and it manipulates uh, plant heredity to develop new and improved plant types uh, for use by society. And plant breeding has been around for an extremely long time. Uh, probably even before there was um, uh, agriculture, uh, hunter and gathering people probably um, recognized that uh, by collecting and dropping seeds in places where they wanted to come back and collect in the, uh, again in the future, uh, that they could um, um, drop some of the best seeds that they, uh, or the seeds from some of the most desirable plants and uh, provide a place that they could come back to and collect uh, um, um, better specimens from in the future. So this idea of plant breeding and selection goes way back in time. Regardless of the technique, um, there's five steps in a breeding program. So the first thing is to plan and set objectives for what it is that uh, uh, you're trying to uh, accomplish. That is, what traits or characteristics of your uh, plant that you're trying to promote or change or improve. Uh, the second is to select a um, the source, uh, the, the, uh, the germplasm, the seeds, or uh, the genetic material that you want to work with and improve upon. Uh, third is to uh, select the, uh, um, the, the specimens um, that you want to continue to uh, uh, improve. In other words, uh, some of the offspring of plants will be undesirable and you do not want to include those in your, in your uh, breeding program. So you're going to just select the uh, few uh, plants that are closest to the um, uh, traits that you want to promote and to work with those to keep moving the process forward. Uh, fourth, uh, evaluation over time. Evaluate where you are in relation to your objectives and uh, decide whether you're on the right track or whether you need to start over again. And then finally, um, in the case of commercial uh, breeding, um, there is a, a certification and cultivar release process that must be followed in order to uh, generate the desired uh, seeds and to be able to offer them for sale. The textbook offers um, a, a good example of this breeding process when it talks about uh, the, the daylily breeding program, and you may want to uh, reference that, that article. So homing in on selection, um, this is what I was talking about. Um, a process that started even when with uh, hunters and gatherers before um, agriculture was uh, an established uh, uh, regime. Uh, it's an age-old practice that began either at the same time as or before farming. Uh, over the years, uh, farmers selected the traits that they liked best, planted the seed, saved and planted the seed from the best portion of their crop, 
and uh, saw improvement over time. Um, then um, here's a little bit of science on selection. Uh, the process of um, measuring progress from one generation to the next is called um, breeders uh, or genetic gain. That is the movement of the characteristics of the plant toward the desired objective. And there's a formula for that, but I think the important thing is to realize that uh, breeders have had spectacular success uh, with both ornamental uh, plants. Uh, this flower here is one example of uh, different forms that have been bred over time of the same plant. But one of the most striking examples is this um, uh, cabbage um, ancestor. The single um, uh, plant has led to, um, through breeding, uh, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, and cauliflower all arise from different selection um, um, and breeding programs over the years. So this is an example of a high degree of genetic plasticity that this uh, weedy uh, mustard plant could be uh, bred into six different and very important uh, uh, vegetable crops. So um, the idea of the way this occurs is by hybridizing or crossing parents uh, to produce uh, offspring that are um, moving to meet um, uh, the goals of a desired plant. A few examples here are uh, peppers. Um, this is a, a red pepper that combines the uh, best uh, traits of a yellow and a uh, smaller uh, red pepper. Um, watermelons have been uh, hybridized uh, in recent years to eliminate seeds. So mostly what we see in stores now are uh, uh, seedless watermelons, which take all the fun out of uh, spitting seeds. And then uh, there's three examples of the um, stages of development from the uh, plant from which corn evolved. So our modern uh, sweet corn and uh, uh, corn that is grown uh, for, it's called field corn uh, or commodity corn that's grown that's used in all of our uh, uh, industrial processes. Uh, evolved over time from this very uh, uh, weedy uh, grain. So a process of hybridization or crossing uh, occurs for many years and in the case of corn uh, that that process has been going on for uh, um, over 5,000 years to get to the varieties of corn that we see today. So we're coming to an important question, and that is, uh, is breeding the same as genetic modification? Well, it is in some ways. The goal is the same. The goal is to produce a, uh, uh, a, a better plant, more suited with the right traits of what, we're, uh, what, what we want to see. But the method is uh, very different. So in breeding, uh, it's a process that uses the natural variation of sexual reproduction to select for certain characteristics, the kind of thing we've been talking about. Uh, genetic modification, on the other hand, uses uh, uh, modern genetic uh, uh, characteristics and, and procedures to alter the genetic material, basically taking a, a gene out of one uh, organism, it could be a bacteria, it could be another plant, and inserting that gene into the DNA of the um, host plant in order to make them more capable of making new substances to um, resist pests or to make them uh, more productive uh, or to change their appearance to the a form that's uh, more to our liking. And we're going to get into more, um, more detail on genetic modification in subsequent slides. 
Now the next uh, uh, option is tissue culture. So tissue culture uses um, clones of horticultural plants. Uh, in other words, a, uh, a section of a stem or a bulb or a root or a leaf in order to produce identical plants. Uh, we're going to talk about this some more in, uh, when we talk about asexual production, uh, but this um, tissue culture produces identical uh, plants and, and does not yield new varieties or genetic differences between plants. Uh, therefore, it's not plant breeding. It's plant propagation, but it's not plant breeding. So a little bit more about uh, genetic modification. Um, it's a special set of technologies that alter the genetic makeup of living organisms. So combining genes from different organisms. Um, so genetic modification uh, is also known as recombinant, recombinant DNA and the resulting organism is called genetically engineered or transgenic. Interesting uh, item on this uh, graphic uh, on the left is that gold particles are shot into the cells uh, with a gene gun uh, to uh, uh, break up the uh, uh, plant cell chromosomes for um, creating these transgenic plants. I guess this must be valuable if they can uh, use gold this way. So um, taking one step back, uh, the Human Genome Project uh, was accomplished more than 10 years ago now, um, but it would involve taking apart and studying the entire uh, human genetic code and now that's been uh, replicated for uh, uh, hundreds of other organisms including many plants and untangling the genetic code or doing this genome mapping uh, is one of the technologies that uh, uh, makes um, modifying the genes possible so in other words you can't really modify genes until you have uh, crack the genetic code and you know what uh, what genes there are and what uh, traits those genes uh, affect. So I want to talk through now uh, three different ways of producing blue roses uh, and you'll maybe this will put into perspective some of the ideas that we've been talking about. So the first approach is breeding uh, roses uh, in a traditional way uh, crossing um, different strains of roses until uh, a rose with the desired um, a color is finally reached. So this has been been accomplished and uh, is an example of um, something that uh, traditional breeding ca programs are capable of doing. Uh, the second uh, way of um, achieving blue roses is by uh, mixing these pigments or changing the pH, uh, uh, in other words, the amount of acidity in the soil. So um, this is a uh, article, this is from an article about a uh, research plant geneticist who um, works for the U.S. Department of uh, Agriculture and he talks about the right genes plus the right amount of pigments uh, can produce blue colors in red roses and by mixing and matching these three pigments an endless array of colors can be created so this guy um, combines uh, uh, both the ideas of traditional um, rose breeding and genetic modification and then he changes the acidity level in the uh, flower cells. With that he says that uh, by sticking genes from one plant or flower into another could create a whole new pla palette of splashy colors to choose from. So I don't know um, 
necessarily why we want uh, green or blue or black roses, but uh, if uh, gardeners have to have them, um, this uh, researcher will help uh, make that happen. And then the third uh, approach to get blue roses is um, the genetic modification route. And to make a, um, a blue rose, uh, you start out with a uh, red and an orange rose, identify this gene, a DFR gene, uh, that determines rose color, turn it off, and first insert a pansy gene in place of the uh, DFR gene in order to open the door uh, for a, uh, a new color to be inserted. And then finally, the third step is to take the, um, the DFR gene from an iris, a different plant, and to insert it into that, uh, into that site through the open door. And uh, what you get is a new um, genetically modified blue rose. But it just um, just presented here to uh, show some of the options and different ways in which um, um, biotechnology is now uh, enhancing or replacing traditional breeding of plants. So here's this idea of gene slicing. You tease open the uh, the, the gene from the chromosome. Uh, you take a uh, uh, chromosome from one plant, insert it into another, and uh, that's called translocation. And after that translocation, you have a plant with a new genotype. And if you've chosen the genotype and perform the procedure correctly, then you have a new phenotype, a new observable trait for that plant. And this is happening. Genetically modified crops are being used on a vast scale across the globe. Uh, over 250 million acres uh, uh, in 22 countries by over 10 million farmers by 2006. Uh, most of the genetically modified crops were um, pest resistant, uh, soybeans, corn, canola, and alfalfa. Um, but there's others, and um, this idea of pest resistance is a pretty compelling uh, reason for um, doing this genetic modification. The, uh, the sweet potato in Africa is one that could be uh, could wipe out the, the uh, harvest on which millions of people rely. Um, that's pretty important reason for uh, modifying the genes. Uh, another one is uh, to produce rice with increased iron and vitamin content that may um, uh, alleviate chronic mal malnutrition in Asia. And then uh, other uh, plants are being uh, uh, developed to survive extremes in weather, extremes of hot and cold weather and uh, drought tolerance. So with uh, 7 million hungry uh, people in the world, um, some of these reasons for um, feeding a hungry population and uh, feeding, uh, assuring that crops survive pests and bad weather and deliver uh, better nutrients are pretty good reasons for producing genetically modified crops. And here's an example of golden rice. Um, comparison of the color between uh, golden and traditional rice and it has a, an, an, an additional uh, amount of vitamin A um, which is uh, a deficiency that uh, affects over 200 million um, children and women worldwide. Um, a lot of other uh, uh, crops are being researched and, and tested uh, with uh, new genetic modifications. Bananas that produce human vaccines against diseases. Uh, fruit and nut trees that yield uh, uh, much earlier and plants that produce plastics with unique properties are all uh, uh, potential future GMOs. Now I also included an article in your uh, readings that shows some pretty silly 
um, GMOs that are also being developed and um, many people have concerns about the whole idea of GMOs that we're going to talk about in the next few slides. So on the one hand, while uh, GMOs offered potential for meeting uh, the hunger uh, challenges of the 21st century, they also posed risks, and many of those risks are unknown. Um, controversies uh, commonly focus on human and environmental safety, labeling, and consumer choice. Uh, intellectual property also comes up, and we'll talk about this in a future uh, lesson. Uh, ethics, food security, poverty reduction, environmental conservation. So there's a huge uh, controversy and um, a lot of different points of view that uh, need to be uh, heard and understood in order to make up your own opinion about whether this is uh, 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 good or bad tech use of technology. Um, many people, uh, in fact millions of people around the world, are totally opposed uh, to uh, GMOs um, and there's scientific reasons for this. Uh, there's political, uh, religious ethics, and ph philosophical grounds. And uh, the target of many of these uh, protests are um, agrochemical companies like Monsanto Corporation uh, who make billions of dollars on the sale of these uh, uh, GMO crops. One of the uh, issues is labeling. Uh, many people uh, uh, in the US where uh, genetically modified foods uh, can make their way into uh, the grocery store. Many people feel that any f uh, food that contains a GMO should be uh, labeled so that consumers have the choice to whether or not to purchase that product. Um, it has uh, not been settled yet, but uh, the um, current um, situation is that uh, labeling is not required on GMO foods. Um, seems to me like a minimal step for uh, an informed consumer, but it's not required today. Other um, pros and cons um, for GMO crops uh, you will um, come across in your uh, readings in order to uh, uh, answer the discussion question. And I just hope that you'll consider the agenda of each source and consider from the standpoint of science, politics, economics, and ethics. Uh, this is a very complicated and important issue and everyone is entitled to their opinion, uh, but I hope that you'll make your own decision and base it on uh, the research that you, uh, that you conduct and uh, uh, intelligent uh, consideration of the, of the issues. So that's it for this week's assignment, uh, or that's it for this week's uh, lecture. Um, Good luck with the assignment and discussion, and I'll check in with you again next week.